Through the Eyes of the Nine, a 1957 civil rights milestone from the viewpoint of the courageous Little Rock Nine who lived it. Countless articles, documentaries, and photographs have told the story of the brave Little Rock Nine and their stirring journey into the annals of civil rights history. Their uneasy wait to enroll culminated with President Eisenhower's federalizing of the Arkansas National Guard and activation of the 101st Airborne Division. Then, on the morning of September 25, 1957, the nine black students finally walked through the front door of the previously segregated Central High. The descriptions and visions of the traumatic events, especially the poignant photograph of young Elizabeth Eckford having previously tried to walk away from a snarling crowd, seem to tell the whole story. The most gripping story, however, comes from the still vivid memories of those who walked through that door. In an attempt to keep them as segregated as possible inside the school, none of the Little Rock Nine were allowed to participate in any extracurricular activities or to even take classes with each other. As the holiday season approached, a nine volunteer, Minajean Brown, hoped the spirit of the season might have loosened this rule and asked to be in the Christmas program. Not only did the school officials stand firm against the idea, they branded her as a troublemaker for even asking. Needless to say, her Christmas spirit quickly dissipated. As time transformed the flashpoint heat of the present into simmering fragments of the past, those nine courageous troublemakers have shared their memories many times. The nine of us were not especially political, Minijean once explained. We thought we can walk to Central. It's a huge, beautiful school. This is going to be great. Jefferson Thomas, another nine member, echoed her expectations after explaining that he actually thought the white kids would be friendly and understanding, he sadly added. It was very discouraging. Another nine survivor, the delicate and fastidiously dressed Gloria Ray, vividly felt that discouragement as well. People really hated me, she observed and my world changed. During the years to follow, a number of the other students have expressed sympathy and regret over the situation. Most knew, however, that to voice that opinion at the time would have brought down a racist wrath on them or their families. Jefferson Thomas noted that the majority of the students were not involved in the abuse there were about 150 to 175, raising all the hell, out of 2,000, he estimated. Obviously, though, that was more than enough to make for an extremely miserable school year. Nine comrade Carlotta Walls added, I didn't find anyone to stand up and defend any of us. Another nine member, Thelma Mothershed, best friends with Minijean and Melba, didn't suffer as much of the hateful abuse as the other eight, simply because of an obvious physical condition. The diminutive girl with thick glasses had a heart condition that at times changed her shade to a purplish blue and often forced her to stoop down to catch a breath. Apparently, even the abusers felt their peers wouldn't approve of their bullying a sickly little girl. The other eight, though, were in for an open season of cruelty and violence. Nine partner Ernest Green reflected that each of them originally felt the friction over their attending Central would produce only a minor blip on the screen. Sadly, the expected blip soon exploded into a non-stop bombardment of terrorism 
designed to break their morale and derail the integration of the school. People didn't realize the extent to which we were tortured daily, Melba observed. Their persecutors would actually hold evening meetings to devise new methods to torment them. Taking matters far beyond any logical form of innocent mischief, the hundred-plus hell-raisers seemed to have no boundaries. Girls would throw broken glass on the floors as the female members of the nine stepped into the shower after gym class. Some oppressors had been trained to stomp on their heels as they walked through the halls. Elizabeth Eckford was once assailed with a hurled handful of sharpened pencils. Melba had acid thrown in her eyes and was only saved from blindness by the quick actions of a guardsman who rushed her to a sink. Amazingly, the targeted victims didn't simply walk away from the abuse and resume their comfortable lives. Gloria Ray summarized their shared fortitude. She said the soldier standing in front of her with his rifle was basically saying, No, you can't have that good education that they're offering inside that school. I'll get that education, had been her mental response, or I'll die trying. Her friend Minijean felt the same resolve, but after she was turned down for the Christmas program and targeted as a troublemaker, she said she felt like she was just lost in abuse. Several times, students threw hot soup on her in the lunchroom. The first time it happened, she recalled, students got up from the lunch table and gave 15 raws for the boy who did it. None of the abusers were ever punished, but Minijean later received a six-day suspension for dumping a bowl of chili on a couple of boys who had been taunting and knocking into her in the cafeteria. In February, her days at Central ended. A group of girls had been stepping on her heels and calling her names, when finally one of them threw a purse toward Minijean's head. To give it extra weight, the girls had stuffed six combination locks inside. Fortunately, Minijean ducked and avoided it. As she retrieved the purse, she discovered the locks. Then, dropping it to the floor, she muttered, Leave me alone, white trash. She was immediately expelled. She later earned her degree at another school. Following her expulsion, she remembered, someone sent around a card that read, One down, eight to go. As history is aware, the remaining eight did not go. Forging through the cruelty, they somehow made it to the end of the year. Ernest Green, the only senior class member among them, graduated, strongly advised by the school's principal to have his diploma mailed to him. Ernest insisted on attending the graduation ceremony to receive it. Surrounded by about 600 white graduates, Ernest proudly stood when his name was called and strode across the stage. As he did, the silence was deafening. Other than the enthusiastic applause of his family and their guest, Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. Although the lens of time has softened some of the hateful faces, it can't erase the indelible images in the minds of the Little Rock Nine. I actually try not to look at those old pictures, Gloria Ray confirmed because it's a lost childhood to me. We were in the trenches, Ernest Green reflected, hand-to-hand -hand combat, practically. At a certain point, Minnie Jean Brown added, I didn't know if I would be alive to graduate from high school or be stark raving insane. Somehow, despite the hand-to-hand -hand combat and brushes with near insanity, the daring teenagers trudged forward. Today, the same city that spurned them now displays their nine statues on the state capitol grounds. 
Those stately bronze figures will forever memorialize the stone-cold nerve of a fateful group of teenagers. They were suddenly thrown into a world of haters and hated, torn apart by bursts of broken glass, blinding acid, and vicious attacks. Those metal statues will forever march into the future just like the brave souls they represent, their courageous little rock nine.